Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome back to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I know we've talked a lot in the last couple episodes about the rain. This is the wettest decade ever since modern records have been kept. And so this is posing many challenges to farming, one of which includes compaction. We had a very wet fall last year, and that continued into the spring. So when we think about soil health, compaction is one of the biggest concerns when we're dealing with wet soils. So to cover compaction, our guest this week is Dr. Scott Shear. He's the chair of the Department of Food, Agricultural, and Biological Engineering at Ohio State University. He's been studying the effect of field compaction for quite a while now. And so today we'd like to talk about what compaction is and look into the future on what farmers can do to mitigate the effects. Welcome, Dr. Shear. Glad to be here and uh, glad to be able to to share some thoughts with you today on this topic. Yeah. To start us off, could you just give an overview of what compaction is? Ideally, when you look at at soil for crop growth, um, it's about 50% soil particles and about 50% void space. The void space when I talk about void space, is really room for water and air. Most people would say that you want about a 25% void space that's, that's air and 25% of the void space is water. Now, we can also argue a little bit about organic matter content when we look at soil particles, but that's kind of the ideal um, or optimum uh, distribution of, of volume, if you want to think of it that way, for crop growth. The problem that, that uh, some farmers experience, obviously, is is when they begin consolidating the soil particles from external loadings uh, coming from gross vehicle weights. And what, what's effectively happening is you're reducing the void space for air and water. And, and that's when it becomes problematic in terms of crop growth. A lot of people will talk about plow pans or I'll, I'll say plow pan, tillage pans if you want to think of it that way. But we'll say layers within the uh, um, below the soil surface where you have higher soil densities, soil bulk densities, than perhaps other areas. And so the question is, over time, what happens in in terms of uh, crop growth? And what I'm really thinking about is uh, what's inhibiting uh, uh, root growth into the soil. Obviously, uh, in a year like this, we're not too worried about uh, deep-rooted plants (laughs) given uh, the the available moisture. But in more typical years, obviously, one of the things that a lot of people get concerned about um, is when we have these compacted layers and then we get a dry uh, summer. And, th- and that's when compaction really, the, the effects of it really show up and are very pronounced. So what really causes compaction? I, I'm going to say, that what, what I like to say is gross vehicle weight, but more importantly, axle load. A, a lot of people begin thinking about the fact that, that if you spread the load out over a greater area and you reduce the, uh, I'm going to say, the soil um, tire contact pressure and or soil track contact pressure that you can alleviate compaction. That's that's not really the case. I want to get people thinking about the fact that really what's doing the damage today is axle loads. Um, if, if we're under um, 10 tons on an axle load, you don't have a lot to worry about. Um, one of the problems today though is the increase in grain cart size. Uh, mm-hmm. You combine that with a wet harvest season and that's when I think things really get uh, very interesting in terms of the damage being done to the soils. One of the things I always caution farmers about is is think about the high gross vehicle weights and the two in Ohio that are consequential obviously are grain carts depending upon the size of the grain cart. But the other one, um, and, and depending upon the nature of the agricultural enterprise, obviously when you begin manu- uh, moving manures to the field. And, and you know we look at a lot of our uh, swine and dairy waste, a lot of moisture, but, but really you're moving uh, pretty large volumes, pretty large uh, weights of materials onto the field. The grain carts and, uh, and manure tankers are the ones that I think of as being the most problematic. I'm not saying that other things aren't, but those are the ones, those are the types of loads that I would be very concerned about. I know you're concerned about those for a specific reason. So to lead into that, there are different types of compaction. Can you talk about those different types and then specifically get into why those really heavy axle loads are a concern? The, uh, what you're referring to is we, we think about um, shallow or surface compaction, and uh, that, that's really a function of the uh, tire or track to soil contact pressures. The, the one that I'm most concerned about, obviously, is deep compaction, and that's being caused by axle loads. Uh, when we look at some grain cars today, we can get some 130 to, to 150, 160,000 pound loads on a single axle. Um, 
not necessarily common, but, but I caution people that what's happening is that we're driving the effects of soil compaction, compaction deeper into the soil. Um, we, we have some models, uh, Randall Reeder has some data suggesting that uh, because of some of the level of, of, of loadings um, with, with equipment today, that we can see the, uh, the effects of uh, soil compaction uh, going as deep into the soil as three or four feet. If it's shallow compaction, I'm not too concerned because you can, you can really mitigate that with, with tillage. We oftentimes talk about deep tillage, and when we're talking about deep tillage, really we're thinking about up to 18 inches. And while we can alleviate some of the uh, soil compaction, my concern is, is what's beyond the, the foot and a half into the soil. Maybe we just rip deeper or whatever. There's a cost to that, obviously, in diesel fuel and the nature of the tillage tools. But I'll remind people that we have tile drainage systems in Ohio. So mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to go a whole lot deeper than about 18 inches in a lot of locations just because of um, where the tile is located. There are some other things that, that we might consider, too. Deep-rooted crops might be able to... Uh, um, mitigate soil compaction, but again, uh, the crop rotations in, in Ohio may not lend themselves necessarily to some of the deep, more deeply rooted crops. I'm really thinking about alfalfa uh, being one of those. Uh, there are some cover crops too that might have some, some uh, value in terms of trying to mitigate soil compaction. My concern really, principally right now, we look at grain production is what's, what's occurring at harvest time. And when I look at the loads at harvest time, I'm really thinking about the combine the front axle on the combine, especially with wider headers and especially with full grain tanks. Uh, you couple that with the grain cart and how much of the field it traffics and under wet conditions, um, it, can, it can be very problematic. I um, also want to caution people a little bit too. The uh, time when we do the most damage in terms of soil compaction is when we're getting close to, uh, to field capacity on, on uh, when we look at moisture. If you have a dry fall harvest, my attitude has always been, I don't care how big the equipment is, but the problem is it's difficult to predict when we're going to have those dry harvests versus uh, the, the, the wetter ones like we've had the last couple of years. Yeah, I know in Aaron Wilson's data, he's seen a trend where we're getting more rainfall, particularly in September. Mm -hmm. And those guys that are trying to get in there early and get that grain off in these wetter soil conditions might be causing issues that have impacts. Yeah, so some of our studies suggest that we're seeing uh, yield reductions of 20 to 30 percent in those years where we traffic the soils when they're wet, and, and I'm talking about with grain carts. Some people might argue, well, yes, but the grain cart doesn't traffic the entire field surface, but we have data su suggesting that many times farmers are actually trafficking 30 percent of the uh, field surface with grain carts. Th there's some mindsets relative to controlled traffic. Um, I think that's very noble, but I also understand under wet harvest conditions, sometimes it's, uh, it's about speed and getting grain off and it causes uh, grain cart operators to do things that maybe aren't in the best interest of uh, maintaining controlled traffic and I'm taught what I'm talking about is driving diagonally across the field from to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. Yeah I, I have to admit I'm guilty yeah. when I'm getting yelled at on the phone for not not being there in time to catch. I yeah I do dumb things from time to time. <laughs> I, I also want to caution farmers about I, I think there's been a trend towards larger grain carts and I understand that but the other thing is be careful that you're not purchasing larger grain carts to um, basically make up for lack of adequate uh, trucking capacity. Mm -hmm. And what I'm thinking uh, about in some respects is you take a modern uh, class eight or class nine combine, good corn harvest, uh, decent grain conditions, you know, you can have harvest rates of 100 bushels a minute. And what I continue to, to encourage farmers to think about is, yeah, I'm able to, to harvest that with my combine. I'm able to, you know, keep my combine unloaded into the grain cart. But the real question is, is can I move that quantity of grain away from the, the, the edge of the, the, the field, if you will? And, you know, it's, it's the weak link in the chain. It's uh, do, you, do I have enough drying capacity? Um, do I have enough trucking capacity? Do I have a big enough uh, pit to hold uh, um, grain when I'm, when I'm dumping or whatever? Th there's all those things kind of downstream of the field that really affect some of the things going on in the field. Uh, some of the modeling we've done suggests that most farmers, uh, if you have adequate trucking capacity, can keep up with class eight and class nine machines with a, with a grain cart as small as six, seven hundred bushels. Mm -hmm. And again, when I begin looking at compaction, that's a much more favorable situation. So I think we've covered most of the effects you've talked talked about, alluded earlier to restricting root growth. 
what are some other maybe effects of compaction that we haven't talked about yet? Well, one of the, one of the things we didn't spend a lot of time on is, is surface compaction. And really, when I begin thinking of surface compaction, I think a lot about what's happening, uh, especially at planting time. And this would be one of those primary years when, and, and I understand if, if a farmer can possibly traffic, uh, traffic the field this year, they're going to get in because they have few alternatives. When I look at the number of, of days when, when really the, the soil was at suitable conditions for planting, they were pretty far and few between this spring. I'm reminded uh, um, there was a colleague, I, I, I posted a picture on Twitter of one of the planters that we were using at Ohio State had tracks on it, but basically the planter was covered with mud, and I said it kind of sums up <laughs> plant 19. And uh, one of my colleagues kind of admonished me for the fact that just because you have tracks doesn't mean you should be in the field planting. <laughs> and I reminded this individual about how far the state of Ohio was behind in planting. Farmers are going to do things uh, because they're kind of forced to it uh, to do it in some respects, and I and I respect the, those decisions, and I know they're difficult ones. But the other thing that I keep thinking about is how we minimize um, some of the damage that's done. Um, we've been strong advocates for tracks on planters. Um, we we got doing got to doing a lot of work on pinch row uh, studies. Really, what we were looking at is uh, the the impact on yield for those uh, those rows next to the the wheels on planters and we're finding enough justification to suggest that farmers should move from wheels to tracks at planting time. There's actually a reverse track effect uh, in some years and that's kind of a, an anomaly but some of the things we've seen in those pinch rows is we actually get better yield when we begin running tracks and that's in comparison to our controls where there's no traffic. What we tend to think of is when we're looking at surface compaction is is let the indentation from the tire or track be an indication of um, what sort of things are going on. Sometimes in wetter soils, wheels will move a lot of soil. They'll push it out to the side and you'll end up with deeper tracks. That's a pretty good indication that we're going to have some pinch row yield impact. On the other hand, if the, the tire is kind of staying up on the surface and you don't see much of a wheel track or much of an indentation, that's probably a pretty good indication that we're not going to see much in the way of, of yield impact. Uh, but the pinch rows, it, it, they can be pretty substantial. Um, you know, typically we're seeing about a, a four to five bushel an acre yield hit um, on, on wheeled planters under typical conditions. And again, I got to be careful making generalized statements like that. It's not going to be the same for everybody. But one of the things that's made it a little bit more problematic today is a lot of farmers have gone to central fill planters. And we look at those central fill planters, a lot of that weight is supported on those wheels immediately behind the tractor uh, on the planter. And so um, I understand farmers uh, really enjoy um, using uh, central fill planters because of the increased field efficiency. But again, there is a bit of a, a price to pay in some conditions. Um, tracks are, are a wonderful thing. That obviously, there's a cost differential there, and we're, we're finding out continually that there's value in, in terms of going to tracks. We, we understand there's an added cost, but the other thing I'll caution uh, farmers about is if you're spread out, you know, a couple counties north to, north to south or east to west, the problem is roadability of these. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases with tracks, we're going to be limited to uh, transport speeds of about 18 miles an hour. So again, it's just, it's one of those things, you, you got to kind of take the, the bad with the good or the good with the bad, depending upon how you view it in some respects. Yeah, there's a lot of decisions here to be made. I mean, again, referring back to some of the work that Dr. Aaron Wilson has done, we are losing about five days in the spring and the fall. Um, and when you talk about a day of work for a farmer, that's not an eight hour day, you know, 16 to 20 hour days. So that's a big loss of time. So, we, you know, the bigger equipment efficiency is improved, but we're seeing some um, negative effects potentially. With well, regards to compaction. there's another thing I think producers need to think about a little bit, and, and that is high-speed planting. And uh, we've done some work here at Ohio State that suggests that, and I'm not advocating any farmers do this, um, but, but we've planted it up to 18 miles an hour and taken it to yield and seen no statistically significant difference in yield. Please, if, if you're <laughs> a producer, don't plant at 18 miles an hour. But my point is, if you're concerned about planting at 7, 8, 9 miles an hour, it's, it's not a concern that the technology today will place the seed, the depth control is good, and, and you're going to get good stands. And so one of the ways to make up for that shortened window, if you will, is for planters to adopt 
high-speed planting technologies. And again, you can turn a, um, a 12 row planter into a 16 row planter or a 16 into a 24. I mean, when you begin thinking about things, it isn't just about the size of the hardware necessarily. It could be the type of technology on the hardware. And so again, getting back to that window, uh, available window for planting, maybe going to high-speed planting enables you to increase your, your field uh, capacity of the equipment by 20, 30, 40%. And, and really, when you look at the cost trade-off, that's not a bad comparison in terms of and comparing that to, if you will, buying a bigger planter. Um, there's also some other things that come with bigger planters. You mentioned efe uh, efficiency. We know that when you go to a bigger planter, the field efficiency goes down. That is, the number of acres per row unit covered per hour uh, drops. And, and we see smaller planters like eight rows having a field efficiency of about 70 or 75%. We get into the 24 and 36 row planters, we know that field efficiency could drop to below 50%, okay? You're covering more acres because you have a wider machine, but, but that machine is sitting idle more of the time. When you go to refill it, uh, when you're doing maintenance on it and things like that, those additional number of rows, um, it takes more time, takes more effort uh, in some respects. And so again, be careful. Uh, I want to caution people about mistaking increased field capacity, that's acres per hour, if you will, from the wider machines, um, and, and kind of there's a trade-off with field efficiency as well. Yeah, I know I was pretty impressed this spring with, even with the four-row planter, when you can go 10 miles an hour, you can cover a lot of ground. It's not like when I started out in ag research, our four-row planter went two and a half, three <laughs> mile an hour. It feels a lot better going 10. <laughs> Well, I think the biggest thing today is uh, is uh, Ohio producers have lots of options. And so the question is, what's best for their farm, for their situation? And I also want to caution people, um, just because your neighbor's done done something doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean you you need to. Um, every equipment complement is, is a bit different. Um, every farm is a bit different. Every crop uh, rotation. You know, there are so many differences between farms, it's hard for me to sit here and make blanket statements about do this, do that. But the other side of the coin is, is farmers do have a lot of options today. Um, many times that technology costs money, but depending upon how the technology is deployed, farmers can actually make money using some of that technology. So you mentioned the smaller equipment could prove more efficient, and anyone who's seen you talk is probably heard about what you see as the future and can you talk a little bit about this future of potentially smaller equipment? I have the pleasure of being able to talk with a lot of people in industry. Back in February I was in uh, in Australia and I visited a company by the name of Swarm Farm. Swarm Farm is building um, small sprayers. They're about 35 horse uh, small diesel engine in them and they're spraying um, uh, probably about 35 foot widths, okay? These machines are operating in the field um, w without any human intervention. This this company, started by a farmer, by the way, built 20 machines this year, and they're no longer selling equipment, rather they're leasing it. Um, they have a bit of a different business model than a lot of others. I've been telling some of the manufacturers uh, here in North America that if we're going to see automation take over, um, in agriculture, one of the first areas is going to be in spray application. And, and there's a couple different reasons. One of the first ones is to get the human out of that, that environment uh, from a safety uh, perspective. But the other thing is, is there's a little bit more tolerance in, in, in spray application, if you will, um, when we look at the agronomics. And uh, most farmers realize this, the, uh, some of the, the active ingredient rates are a little bit higher to make up for. Um, marginal application type situations. But I continue to tell the, uh, the the big three manufacturers that the first things they're going to notice if automation takes hold is there's going to be a drop in, in sales of high clearance sprayers in favor of these smaller machines. I've been a strong advocate um, for smaller equipment because I, I think the trade-off is if we go under 10,000 pounds and under contact pressures of 3 PSI we can personally do away with soil compaction. In my estimation, that drives a shift towards automation more so than almost anything else. It's not about labor when we look at automation. It's about doing things that we're not able to normally do. One of the other uh, takeaway uh, messages from that uh, visit in, uh, in Australia or earlier this year, visiting with the, uh, the owners of uh, Swarm Farm, was they were suggesting to me that the cost of spray application using their machine was about 80 cents an acre. 
um, per application. Now, when I begin comparing that to high clearance sprayers here in the U.S. And, and the cost there, what I'm really talking about is the cost of the equipment, the cost of service, maintenance of the equipment, things like that. It's void of, obviously, the cost of whatever the herbicide is. But when I start seeing differentials like that, it tells me that the market uh, more than likely is going to shift pretty quickly. But again, we'll wait and we'll wait and see what happens. Um, I wish I had a crystal ball and could tell everybody when we're going to shift to autonomous equipment and uh, how quickly it's going to occur. But I'm certain it's coming, and one of the first areas, at least in row crop production, we're going to see it is with, in my estimation, spray application. One of the things, it's, it's been my assertion that when we look at deep compaction, we notice we have a lot of farmers in, in northwest Ohio, and lake bed soils going back in and splitting those tile lines. You know, originally they were on 40 or 60 foot um, spacing. Now some of that tile is at 20 and 30 foot because they're finding it advantageous to do so. One of my assessments is is part of the reason they're they're finding it advantageous to do so is because equipment size has gone up and we've consolidated the soil, mm -hmm. and we're seeing um, higher compacted soil levels in that subsoil, um, and that may be one of the things driving that in some respects. I also wonder about um, certainly there's a concern over weather patterns, um, you know evolving weather patterns, changing weather patterns, whether they be naturally or man-induced. Um, I don't want to necessarily get into that discussion, but I also think one of the concerns today is when we look at um, soil health, if you will, part of that is compaction, is the infiltration rates into the soil. Um, I think because of the equipment size, we could be seeing greater runoff rates because the soils aren't able to handle the rainfall events as maybe they did in the past when equipment was smaller. And so that's one of my concerns going forward, too. When we look at uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus on the Western Lake Erie Basin, I think there's a number of contributing factors. I would hate to, to say that there's a silver, silver bullet that's going to, uh, to change that situation, but I think it could be a confluence of a number of situations. Increasing equipment size, size could be one of those things that is uh, contributing to the problem that we have today. I'm not saying it is the root of the problem. I'm saying rather it's a... It's a factor that I think that needs to be considered in the process. Well, Dr. Shear, you've given us a ton of great information today. Do you have some resources that you could share in case our listeners would like to follow up and get more information? The, the one thing I'm going to point to, the, the most direct thing that farmers can access in, in, in terms of learning what we're doing here at Ohio State is e-fields. And Again, one of the things we're trying to do is research that's conducted at the university, research that's uh, conducted in cooperation with the AR a and R educators in the counties, we're trying to uh, put that in a format um, that's easy for farmers to consume, and we're trying to provide that as quickly as we can after that uh, after those field investigations have been uh, completed. Um, our goal, in a lot of cases, and and you know this well, Elizabeth, as as as, as well here, is that um, we're trying to get this out and get it published, you know, as soon after the first of the year as possible. And a tremendous number of talented ANR educators helping with this process. We we hope that we can continue. Um, obviously, uh, when, whenever we do these investigations, the pinch row compaction, things like that, that we can get that information published and get it in the hands of people that can use it. Um, e fields continues to evolve. Um, the, obviously, it's been published twice now. But, but I hope when uh, producers are able to compare the, the, the first version of it with the second version, so to speak, they begin to see some of the value. Um, one of the greatest things uh, I think that was added to it in, in uh, the, this most recent uh, publication was um, a bit of an economic analysis. So they can begin looking at some of these technologies and saying to themselves, yeah, I can see that paying on my, on my operation, or no, I'm not covering enough acres to, to make that worth it. So. But, but again, what Amanda's doing um, in, in the counties, along with a lot of a &R educators, we very much appreciate that. And, uh, and hopefully we can continue to uh, evolve e-fields to better meet the needs of Ohio producers. Absolutely. Yep. Well, thank you again for your time. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. I enjoyed the opportunity. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.